we have no effective mechanism or we think we have an insufficient mechanism for making sure that the level of difficulty of all those exams, and there are about 110 law schools involved in this process, that they're all of an equivalent standard. The British re-regulation is ultimately, I think, going to require the law schools to have to be a little bit more sensitive to what's going on in the marketplace than they perhaps have been heretofore. And I think that would be an equally important thing in the States. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams coming to you from Southern California. I read a legal blog called May It Please the Court. And this is Bob Ambrosi coming to you from Massachusetts, where I write a blog called Law Sites and also co-host another Legal Talk Network program called Law Technology Now with Monica Bay. Well, Bob, before we introduce today's topics, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Clio and Latera. Clio's cloud-based practice management software makes it easy to manage your law firm from intake to invoice. Try it for free at Clio.com. That's C-L-I-O dot com. And Latera, the authority on document creation, collaboration, and control. Increase your productivity, collaborate securely, and ensure protection of your vital information. You can learn more at www.latera.com. That's L-I-T-E-R-A dot com. Well, the regulatory body that oversees the legal profession in England and Wales, called the Solicitor's Regulation Authority, has enacted a major overhaul of legal training and solicitor licensure. This will take effect in 2020. And the SRA's overhaul has been met with both praise and some resistance. The Law Society out of the UK has stated in a press release that it strongly supports centralized assessment to ensure all solicitors meet consistently high standards, but has insisted that the new system must be realistic with regarding work experience. The SRA has said that meeting the standards required is their focus. It's not the journey, that it's the destination. And as a side note here, we've reached out to the University of Law and the Law Society out of the UK, but were unavailable to participate at Showtime. So we look forward to having them in on a future discussion to talk about this important legal topic. Well, today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we're going to talk about this new solicitor's qualification exam, how it eliminates the requirement of attending law school in favor of this exam, what its impact might be on students, the legal community, and whether it might have any spillover impact here in the States eventually. And Bob, to help us do that, we've got a great lineup, and our first guest is attorney Mark Cohen, who's the CEO of Legal Mosaic, a legal business consulting company out of D.C., Mark is a distinguished lecturer in law at Georgetown Law School and writes a weekly column on the global legal marketplace for Forbes. Mark recently wrote a piece for Forbes entitled, A British Reboot of Legal Education, Law School Optional. Welcome to the show, Mark Cohen. Pleasure to be here. Thanks. Also joining us today is Julie Brannon. Julie is the Director of Education and Training for the Solicitor's Regulation Authority out of the UK. She joined the SRA in October 2013, and since then has been leading the Training for Tomorrow Review of Legal Education and Training. The SRA is the regulatory body for solicitors in England and Wales, and it's at the center of our discussion today. Thanks very much for joining us today, Julie Brandon. No, it's a pleasure. Thanks very much for having me on. We're really happy to have you. I wonder if we could start by, Julie, asking you to Tell us what the SRA has done here. What is the solicitor's qualifying examination about? Yeah, so it's a new competency-based exam. And really the starting point was that we did a big piece of research to identify all the competencies, the skills, the knowledge needed to practice as a solicitor. And from that, we created something that we called a solicitor's competence statement. And the solicitor's qualifying exam essentially checks, it assesses whether candidates have the competencies set out in the solicitor's competence statement. So the start of this was to make sure that the exam that we were going to introduce, a national exam for all intending solicitors, to check 
that it was going to assess the right things, that if somebody passed, they were competent to practice, and that the people who failed, failed because they were not competent to practice. And the thinking around that was that that gives us a, a high level of certainty that the consumers uh, for whom we regulate are protected from incompetent solicitors. And so far as students are concerned and, and the learning of students is concerned, the thinking is that if it, it recognizes, if you like, that assessment drives learning. So we know that students are motivated by what they know they're going to be examined on. And lots of people, you, you hear academics being critical about that and talking about systems which involve teaching to the test. But actually, it's a really positive thing. If you use it right, it's a fantastic motivator for students. So if you're assessing the right things, then students are going to be learning the right things and clients are going to be protected. They're going to be advised by high-quality solicitors. And then the thinking moves on from that, that if we're checking at the end that people have these right competencies, they've learned the right things in order to be able to pass the, the exam, then we don't need to specify particular courses or particular ways of learning. We can say, we don't mind how you learn as long as you get to the right place at the end. So it enables us to be much more open um, to different new ways of learning what it's enabled us to do is to say, you know, not everybody has to have a law degree. People, we think lots of people will continue to go to university to study law, and that's fine. But we've also introduced apprenticeships. Students might take a degree in a different subject and then do a preparatory course to prepare for the SQE. They might do that through distance learning. They might do it through, through self-tuition. There might be lots of different ways in which they acquire the necessary knowledge, but we check at the end of the day that they've got to the right place. And so that gives us the, the protection that consumers need. But at the same time, it actually underpins and gives market credibility to new ways of learning because people who come through those new ways of learning can then say to recruiters, I am the equal of my peers. I may have, been a, have gone through an apprenticeship route rather than a law degree route, but I've demonstrated that I've passed the assessment, I'm competent to practice, and therefore, you know, you should recruit me. So that's the thinking. It's that we've got a higher level of certainty that people have reached the right standard, but also we can recognize much more flexible ways of learning that recognize the cost of legal education at the moment, that recognize that if people have different circumstances in their life, which may mean they want to work part-time or uh, in, in flexible ways, and that actually different people learn in different ways too. Some people learn best in the workplace, other people learn better in the classroom. That's none of our business. We don't mind about that as long as they get to the right end point. Can I just follow up? Just because a lot of our listeners are in the United States and may not be familiar, what is the current system of qualification that this will be replacing? So currently what happens is there are two main ways of qualifying as a solicitor in England and Wales. One is to do a law degree, and then you go on and do a one-year professional training course, and then you go and do a two-year training contract, and then you qualify. And the other way, which is actually surprisingly popular, is that you do a non-law degree, you do a one-year conversion course, which teaches you all your black letter law, then you do the professional training course, and then you do the, the, the two-year training contract. So we already have solicitors who don't have law degrees, but we, have, we require them to follow that particular route, and the people who assess that route are the universities. So each university sets its own examination. What we do not have in England and Wales at the moment is a centralized bar exam. So we don't have a, you know, I know in, in the United States, each jurisdiction has its own bar exam. We do not have that. So we have a slightly strange position where the universities set and mark their own exams, and that's what licenses lawyers to practice. And we have no effective mechanism, or we, have, we think we have an insufficient mechanism for making sure that the level of difficulty of all those exams, and there are about 110 law schools involved in this process, that they're all of an equivalent standard. And Mark, how is this being received in England? I, I would suspect that uh, as 
We've looked back at English history that things don't change much over time. Yeah, well, well, actually, um, it's true that uh, the Americans generally think of the state British, but in fact, I think you have to uh, put uh, the recent um, action of the SRA into a little bit of a broader context. Uh, let me do that just very quickly. So the SRA was, in fact, created as a result of a remarkable two-year study by uh, Sir John Clementi, uh, who after two years of examining the uh, legal industry in the UK, including legal education, concluded that it was not serving the public terribly well and that uh, re-regulation had to be affected. Um, And so uh, that resulted in a a equally remarkable act called the Legal Services Act of 2007. Most people in the States know the so-called LSA 2007 because it allows for so-called alternative business structures. That is, it uh, sanctions the ownership of law firms uh, by non-lawyers. It also allows for institutional investment in law firms, even uh, allows law firms to go public, which some have. And at that time, Clementi determined that, uh, and by the way, he was a non-lawyer, but um, the vice chair, I believe, of the Bank of England and also the CEO of a very large insurance conglomerate. So although he was not a lawyer, he was a large consumer of uh, legal services, studied the industry very closely, and obviously, I think, took a very detached view of some of its deficiencies. So one of the really interesting things that he did was he determined that the uh, SRA should be created as an independent uh, regulatory body separate and apart from the Law Society, which is very analogous to our American Bar Association. And he determined that to really um, be independent and to act uh, really in the best interest, not just of lawyers themselves, but also the public, the SRA had to have teeth. And so when the SRA determined that alternative business structures were to be invoked, it really shouldn't come as a surprise to most Americans that they would then turn around uh, some years later and decide that legal education was also in need of re-regulation. Note, I did not say um, deregulation, but re-regulation, which is really what I think the so-called super exam is doing. It's re-regulating, giving more roads to Rome than the present um, system allows. So uh, a long-winded way of answering the question to say that I think that, in fact, the British are well advanced uh, from uh, the U.S. in terms of their concern for how the public is uh, responding to uh, the legal industry and what changes the legal industry um, should properly have made by an independent regulator to better serve the public interest. And by the way, young lawyers as well. Julie, how are the older lawyers reacting to the barristers and solicitors in England? How are they reacting to this significant change and the difference in the exams they had to take? Um, I think it's very mixed. Quite a lot of people, uh, well, 30 years ago, people did qualify through a national licensing exam. That was only removed in 1993. So in a way, we're going back to a position that once was established. So uh, quite a lot of uh, solicitors understand that actually there are some problems with the current education system. There's a lot of concern about the cost of education. I think that's a similar theme that you have in the United States. Um, It's expensive to qualify as a solicitor, and a lot of people spend a lot of money on taking courses, but are unable to find jobs at the end of it. So there's a lot of wasted money as well. But I just wanted to pick up a point that Mark made, which I thought was absolutely spot on. This is indeed about re-regulation, not deregulation. We think that the SQE will be a much more rigorous and robust assessment of professional competence. Um, The test will be set at the right standard. It will be consistent for everybody who wants to qualify as a solicitor. It will assess legal knowledge, but also legal skills. So it will assess critical thinking. It will assess people's ability to communicate, to advocate on behalf of their clients, to do legal research, uh, and so on. So there will be a whole series of 
things that we will assess. And we think that that will be much more rigorous and much more transparent than the current system that we have. And I think some people uh, recognize that. And I think the, the support from the Law Society that you mentioned at the beginning recognizes that in principle, that is a better system than the system that we have at the moment. Julie, I know that I think it was last year, your agency put into effect new, would it be fair to say, standards of competence for solicitors? That's right. That's what I mentioned at the start, the solicitor's competence statement. And that really is the underpinning for everything. That says, this is what all solicitors must do. And so post-qualification, that is what solicitors need to be able to maintain. And they need to take appropriate steps to make sure that they, they keep up to date with the law and competent to practice as set out in the solicitor's competence statement. But pre-qualification, that is what we assess. So we assess that people have those competencies and are ready to be licensed and to start work as solicitors. So what's driving that? Is, is it simply attempting to maintain consistency across uh, solicitors, or is there something in the market, in the profession, that, that's driving this focus on uh, standards of competence and training? So I think it's, it's very much uh, recognizing, um, again, as Mark said, that our regulatory focus, our core regulatory purpose, is to protect consumers of legal services. So if that's your core purpose, you need to be to have good systems in place. You need to focus your regulatory effort on making sure that new entrants to the profession meet the required standard and that people who are already admitted maintain their competence and maintain those standards too. So it's, it's really very much connected with our regulatory purpose. All right. Well, we're going to uh, take a quick break at this point for a word from our sponsors. Please stay with us and we'll be back in just a moment to talk more about what's going on with the solicitor regulation in the UK. Documents are the currency of business. They represent you in every business interaction. Executives need to know what changes have occurred in documents, what metadata risks exist, and how to encrypt, share, and collaborate securely. Patera simplifies the document creation and collaboration process to protect you from risk and loss of reputation. Patera offers better solutions for document lifecycle management so you can focus on doing what really matters. www.latera.com Imagine what you could do with an extra eight hours per week. That's how much time legal professionals save with Clio, the world's leading practice management software. With intuitive time tracking, billing, and matter management, Clio streamlines everything you do to run your practice from intake to invoice. Try Clio for free and get a 10% discount for your first six months when you sign up at their website, clio.com, that's C-L-I-O.com, with the code L2L10, that's L2L, the number 10. Welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. This is Bob Ambrogi, and with us today is attorney Mark Cohen, author of an article in Forbes, A British Reboot of Legal Education, Law School Optional, and Julie Brannon, Director of Education and Training at the SRA. And we're talking about how the UK is eliminating the requirement of attending law school in favor of a skills-based exam. Mark Cohen, what can we extract from this that we should bring over to this side of the pond. Is this something that the United States is likely to emulate or that we should be thinking about emulating? And as you address that, Mark, could you also talk about whether or not we'll ever see a national examination here in the United States? Sure. So uh, let me break it down into uh, three different parts then. The first of Bob's two-part question is, you know, what should we take here? Um, I think what we should take here is the fact that, um, and, and I think there are remarkable parallels uh, between uh, what's going on in British and Wales legal education and here, in that clearly law graduates uh, on our side of the pond are not practice ready. That's a big issue because the economics of legal delivery have changed dramatically, particularly since the global economic crisis of 2008. And clients, whether they're retail clients or whether they're uh, large corporations practicing in the corporate end of the marketplace, are no longer willing to subsidize on-the-job training for young lawyers. So not only, as uh, Julie said, you know, is this better for the public 
to have lawyers uh, who go through their training and licensure and are actually ready to practice. But also, it's, it's better for lawyers, too. They can find jobs. Uh, They don't have to try to work their way out of a huge amount of debt. In the U.K., I believe the cost of a three-year legal education is about uh, 50,000 pounds, somewhere in the order of about $65,000, $70,000. In the United States, it's it's more than three times that amount, and the average U.S. law school-only debt for graduates is well into six figures. That places a just a terrible burden on uh, young lawyers, not to mention the fact, as I said before, that they do not have the skill set or experience necessary to practice. Contrast that, say, with the medical profession, uh, where young physicians do, in fact, have extensive clinical experience through internship and residency. um, And when they are, in fact, doctors in the marketplace, they, in fact, are practice ready. So I think that all of those reasons and more, we should be adopting a re-regulation of American legal education, which is clearly failing. In terms of uh, what will we adopt, I think that that's a very different question altogether. And the reason why it's a different question is principally because unlike uh, the UK, which has a separation between the SRA and uh, the Law Society, we don't have that separation here. And the ABA and state bars are basically controlling the licensure apparatus in this country. And they, unfortunately, have a very entrenched vested interest. I personally believe that it would be far more effective if we were to do what the uh, UK has done and separate out those two regulatory bodies. Um, I think there's a place for each of them, but I don't think that self-regulation is any longer uh, serving either the public or ultimately and paradoxically lawyers uh, terribly well. And Mark, that would happen on a state-by-state basis? Yes, that would happen in a state-by-state basis. Craig, with respect to your question about a national exam, we have various states' rights issues um, that you know would be implicated that I think would preclude any kind of national exam coming into play anytime soon. I think there are certainly workarounds for that. Uh, We do effectively have a part of our bar exam uh, has the multi-state, which is adopted by most most all states. But with respect to, um, you know, sort of more of a national competency standard, I think there are definitely ways that that could be done. I think the important thing here is to consider what Julie said, which is that you really do want to have practice-ready lawyers. You also want to have lawyers who have a certain modicum of experience. And I think, again, um, it is far more important in terms of protecting the public, and I'm thinking here more in terms of retail law clients, that is, people who are getting divorced, buying a house, have DUIs, things like that, as opposed to sophisticated corporate work. And retail work, you want to make sure that if someone says that he or she is a lawyer, that that individual does have a certain baseline competency. Otherwise, you're just really not doing a very good job of protecting the public. And for that matter, you're doing lawyers uh, a disservice as well. So can I come in uh, briefly, because I just wanted to pick up a a couple of points that Mark made. Please do. Uh, First of all, Mark, I I do agree with you about the, it has undoubtedly been an advantage for us that we are an independent regulatory body. And in fact, the Law Society in the early 2000s tried to reform legal education at that point and just really got bogged down in it and wasn't able to, to, to drive the reform through. I think it really has helped that we we are independent and we're, we're able to, to take this forward. And the other point is about practice-ready lawyers. You mentioned that physicians in the U.S. have to do placements and internships and so on. And actually, we have retained that in our system. So we have a very long established tradition of what used to be called article clerkships, article clerks, which are now called trainee solicitors. Um, I mentioned at the start that it's a two-year period at the moment where you have to be uh, working under the supervision of a solicitor in a law firm. And 
There are advantages and disadvantages about that system. We think that it creates a bit of a bottleneck. There are not enough training contracts to go round. But nevertheless, there were some clear benefits. And, and the benefits that you describe, Mark, actually, the, the socialization, the um, exposure to ethical issues, the exposure to competencies that actually are quite hard to teach and learn in the classroom, like how to to deal with a client, you know, who might be distressed or who might not be giving you the full picture, all those sorts of things. Um, so what we've tried to do about work experience is, is we've retained the two-year requirement, but we've made it wider. So if you get a training contract, that's fine. But also if you're working in a, a, a placement as part of a university degree in a law firm, that's fine. Also, if you're working as an apprentice, that's fine. Interestingly, if you're working as a paralegal, that would also be fine because, of course, while you're working as a paralegal, you are doing the sort of work under the supervision of a solicitor, which helps develop your competences, you know, once you've passed the SQE, to be admitted as a solicitor. Bob and Craig, may I just uh, chime in one other uh, thing that uh, uh, crossed my mind as I was listening to Julie, to your questions? Go ahead, Mark. Uh, And that is that I think, first... I think that if you have a competency-based, experiential learning-based, across-the-board examination, and you don't have the concurrent burden of very expensive law schools, you are going to draw a far more diverse legal population. Uh, And I think that's really, really important now, particularly, um, you know, whereas here you've got certain segments of the population who are grossly underrepresented by more diverse lawyers. The second point is that I think that, you know, in terms of the finances of it, I just think that it is really, really, really um, uh, very sad that law school has gone up 400 percent in terms of uh, the cost over the last 25 or so years, when in fact the curricula of most law schools are virtually identical to what they were years ago, save for the fact that there are all sorts of uh, very exotic courses being offered that really have very, very, very little to do with professional competency. So I think that the British re-regulation is ultimately, I think, going to require the law schools to have to, you know, sort of be a little bit more sensitive to um, what's going on in the marketplace than they perhaps have been heretofore. And I think that would be an equally important thing uh, in the States. I find myself thinking about the Washington State's uh, limited licensed legal technician program, which uh, launched a couple of years ago in, in the state of Washington here, which, yep. Mark, in some ways was an attempt to kind of address some of what you're talking about, to make uh, the ability to practice law uh, more accessible to people to become a, a legal professional, but to still maintain you know, a level of licensing oversight and competence oversight. Yeah, I mean, again, let's let's draw from the medical profession. I was uh, watching this morning an ad put on by nurse practitioners, and there's another example. I mean, they basically perform a very critically important triage kind of function for people who might not otherwise have access to MDs. Uh, I don't know why we couldn't have a similar kind of a thing in the law, uh, particularly whereas in this country, as you well know, Bob, Almost uh, 85, 90 percent of people who need lawyers in this country simply don't get them because they can't afford them. That's a national disgrace, and it's a real uh, test of the power of our democracy and the rule of law. Yeah, yeah, good. Well, it looks like we've just about reached the end of our program, so at this point we'd like to invite our guests to share their final thoughts and provide their contact information to our listeners if they'd like to so that they can reach out to them and follow up after the show. So, Julie, let's start with your wrap-up and then your contact information. Yeah, so um, as I said, it's really focused on two things, uh, the solicitor's qualifying exam. It's a more rigorous focus on standards, but it is also designed to take away some of the barriers that Mark's been talking about that prevent people who are talented enough, they have the right ability to make good solicitors, but there are barriers in terms of cost or, in the English context, access to training contracts. And we're removing some of those barriers so we can get the most talented people through. But, you know, that's fair. But as Mark says, it's good for the profession and it's good for consumers as well. It's a real win-win. 
So we hope that this will work. We've got a lot of work to do now. We want to work collaboratively with the profession, the universities, to, to get something in place that, that really is, is world class. Um, and if anybody wants to contact me to find out some more about this, I'd be delighted to hear from you. The best way to do that is through email. And my email address is julie.brannan, that's J-U-L-I-E dot B-R-A-N-N-A-N at S-R-A dot org, O-R-G dot U-K. And my sum up is really short and sweet, which is I'll have what... Uh the SRA is serving. I really wish that uh, the United States uh, would adopt uh, some form of ABS, and more particularly, I really wish that the U.S. legal educational establishment, the academy, would take a long, hard look at the super exam and the many salutary purposes that it is providing. You can reach me at LegalMosaic.com or on Twitter at LegalMosaic. Well, thanks again to Mark Cohen, CEO of Legal Mosaic, and Julie Brannon, Director of Education and Training for the Solicitor's Regulation Authority. We really appreciate both of you taking the time to be with us, especially Julie, for whom it's rather late at night right now. So uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to be with you guys and you, Julie. Craig, what do you think? You got any thoughts on uh, whether we should be uh, getting rid of law school or uh, changing the law exam? Well, you know, as we had on the show before, Dean Erwin Chemerinsky from UCI has changed that law school's education and made it centered on legal skills and development and writing and addressing the court and dealing with exactly what it is that lawyers do. So the, I think there is, in a small way, legal education in the United States is beginning to change. And certainly the federal government, the federal uh, district courts, the Supreme Court could get together and start a uh, national examination to practice in federal court. Certainly the United States Patent and Trademark Office has done that. Uh, They have their own separate examination to be able to practice there. There's no reason why the federal bar couldn't do the same thing. And then begin to establish a a national examination and phase out over time the need for separate state examinations or just knock the states down to one day apiece. Out of the three-day bar examination, just give the states one day. Yep. Makes a lot of sense to me. I, and I, I, I would just echo what Mark said. I think the UK is kind of setting the standard that we really should be looking at in terms of how to uh, better serve consumers through the legal system and uh, at the same time ensure that uh, services are, are competent and well-regulated. And uh, we have a lot to learn from what they're doing. And I, I hope we follow some of their lessons. But And I, I want to particularly echo Mark's comment that there is no reason to establish some type of access through a legal practitioner's examination to allow the segments of our population that are not currently served with attorneys. Because in the current political climate, that's certainly something that needs to be taken into consideration for people that can't afford it. The rule of law that should exist should exist from top to bottom and shouldn't just be open to the people that can afford it. Hear, hear. Amen. (laughs) Hear, man. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, Thanks again to our guests and to all of our listeners and everybody at the Legal Talk Network who makes our show possible. This is Bob Ambrogi, and uh, on behalf of uh, my co-host, Jay Craig Williams, thanks for listening. Join us next time for another great legal topic. When you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi for their next podcast covering the latest legal topic. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Consult a lawyer.